Hello my friends, it is Sarah the Itty Bitty Celtic Witch and we are here today to explore alternative forms of a divination. So reading the signs beyond the cards and specifically beyond the tarot card or oracle card system. We are actually going to be including and taking a look at a couple cards in this video as they are connected with the Ogum. So let's kick it off by taking a look at runes. So runes were a linguistic alphabet used by the Vikings probably starting around the third century and runes were used quite widely from Britain to Nordic countries to Scandinavian countries. There was a wide regional range in which runes were a very familiar form of the alphabet and this led to a few different adjustments and and variations depending on these regions. For instance, the Anglo-Saxon version of the runic alphabet has a few more runic characters in it and in different runic alphabets sometimes the letters will be shaped differently and this all sort of emerged from regional differences based on local dialect and how they translated that into a runic symbol form. It would have been used to write short brief messages and these would have been written on most likely a piece of rock or stone or wood. And when these messages were sent on these pieces of wood or pieces of stone, they were usually quite brief because at the time that runes were in widespread use, the tradition of telling stories, of sharing knowledge, this was largely an oral history sort of tradition. So there would have been somebody in the community, somebody in the family who had a really good memory. They would learn all of these stories over their lifetime and then pass these stories down through the generations. So when we are looking at runes as an alphabet, it's not so much manuscripts that come to mind immediately, it's more so the use of quick brief messages because there was this deep oral tradition which was the primary source of memory at this time. So those are sort of the original roots that runes came from. Today we recognize them most often associated with uh, divination, with new age communities, with witchcraft, with paganism. That's where you're going to see a lot of runes and a lot of materials about runes beyond the sort of historical references. In my own practice I do actually have a set of runes but I am in all honesty a bit of a beginner when it comes to using them as a form of divination and that's simply because I created my runes and then I got really into tarot and my study of tarot and oracle and the cards kind of took over for a while and now that I'm getting back into the exploration of the history of runes I'm really looking forward to including runes in my spiritual practice sort of going forward. So the second one is the ogum and the ogum very very similar to the runes was an alphabet originally. Now this comes from more of a central focus on the British Isles from Scotland to Wales. It was used in Ireland as well and the Ogham was like the runes, a system of recording languages. And if you look at them visually, they are quite similar in the sense that they have very straight lines, which are quite a bit easier to carve into stone or wood than a curved S or C, for instance, from our modern English alphabet. And the Ogum was used probably around the 4th to the 6th century. The Ogum was thought to be named after the Celtic god Ogma. Also there's variations of the spelling based on region so you can also find information on Ogma by looking into Ogmios. So in Celtic mythology Ogma was the son of the Dagda. He was associated with literacy, with learning, and so it feels very fitting that his name would have been transferred onto a alphabetic system of the time. So today modern interpretations 
of the ogham are again similar to the runes. We're used more for divination now rather than a linguistic purpose. So if you're looking to work with the ogham, you can approach this in sort of one of two ways as far as I have found. There are ogham sticks or ogham staves. Both of these wordings are going to set you on a journey to find some really beautifully crafted uh, ogham staves which are strips of wood that have a single ogham letter carved on them and then you can draw one of these similar to how you would draw a card or you can cast them. They are also available in card format with the Celtic Tree Oracle and the Celtic Tree Oracle also includes a tree in the center and a depiction of the full sort of arborous beauty of the ogham upon which it is based because the ogham was not just sort of a alphabet that was depicting letters but each of these letters are also associated with a tree. So with the Celtic tree oracle you then get the depiction of the tree alongside the symbol of the ogham and I have found that to be a very sort of helpful learning tool. I know there is some issues around the research in this particular book but working with the imagery of the cards, working with the tree energy and the ogham symbol in particular has been a really strong way for me to develop my connection with the ogham over time. So if you are looking for something and you're coming from sort of a tarot card reading background, then this is a very sort of familiar way to dive into the energy of the ogham. So then we have pendulums. And when you're working with pendulums, usually you can find them either as a chain or a crystal at the end in a sort of shape that allows it to dynamically move around. They are all mostly in the shape. There's also wooden pendulums that I have seen around. This particular one is an unikite pendulum and when working with a pendulum these are usually used for yes or no questions and you'll ask it while holding it which direction is yes or which direction is no and this could be it spinning in a circle. This could be yes and a straight line could be no. It's going to depend on the particular pendulum. But these are a very sort of convenient way if you are looking for sort of a quick bit of insight to explore some divination in a different form than cards. This is also paired really well with cards. You can ask perhaps a yes or no question, then get out your cards and dive further into why this might be the approach that spirit is suggesting at the time. So pendulums are something that can essentially work really well alongside the cards or completely on their own. And you can also make a pendulum if you don't want to sort of go out and purchase one. I often use my pendant as a pendulum. So if you have a pentacle necklace or just a necklace that has charms or symbols which is sort of weighted on the end and will provide the weight that it needs to actually spin around in a circle, then you can use this as a pendulum. And sometimes that can be a more powerful connection, especially if it's a necklace or a pendant that you wear a lot of the time. It's going to hold a lot of your energy and make it very easy to work with. And following pendulums, we have scrying. So scrying can be done in a water, it can be done with a mirror, it can be done with a crystal ball. In my practice when working with scrying, I usually go with a crystal ball and I find it very meditative to sort of look at the crystal ball, allow images to come to mind, and spend some time in that meditative mindset, just connecting with the energy of the crystal, connecting with the energy of spirit, and getting into a really essentially a magical mindset. So scrying is a sort of the classic version of divination in pretty much every stereotype of a witch ever. There is like a crystal ball and they're like massive, right? They're like sitting around the table and they've got this crystal ball and there's lights flashing and things are shaking and the table's rising to the ceiling. Things are probably not going to happen like that when you take out your crystal ball just in the morning. Like the table probably won't rise up, the curtains won't shake, the ceiling won't 
tremble and the lights won't flicker, but that's okay. You're still connecting with your crystal because life and magical practice is not like the movies. Complete little ramble there about stereotypes and witches, but like you can't not when you're talking crystal balls. Then there's signs in nature, and this is one of the sort of classic ways to look out for messages from spirit. And this is probably one of my favorite ways to connect with spirit. It's one that is included very frequently in my magical practice. Signs in nature are going to really vary depending on your practice, depending on your approach to interpreting messages from spirit. And this is something that can grow over time. So if you're, if you're hearing this and you're feeling like, geez, I've been missing out on a whole ton of signs from spirit. Don't panic. Don't stress out. This is something that comes with building awareness, building a relationship with nature, and exploring this uh, green path along the way. Exploring a connection with animals, exploring a connection with trees, and with the energy of the natural world around us. Then in practice, these signs can appear in ways like seeing a bird or a particular part type of bird more frequently, a feather falling into your path, seeing a particular animal and learning more about the symbolism, about the correspondences, about the historical understanding of that animal's role in companionship with human society or within its own animal community. So, exploring the signs in nature is something that is a, it's basically developing and building a relationship with nature and being aware of certain messages and certain signs when they are coming in from spirit. I know from my own practice that at times there will be birds that fly by, very specific birds that fly by, when I need to be paying more attention to a certain thing. And keep in mind that these signs might not be popping up all of the time. Spirit will send these as needed, perhaps when you're having a sad day, or maybe when you're celebrating, you'll see a sign of joy emerge from the earth. So if you're looking to incorporate this part of divination beyond the cards into your practice, a good stepping stone is to build a relationship with nature to begin exploring that connection further and just bringing more awareness to your time outdoors. Then we have dream magic and dream magic is something which gets kind of like a, I guess almost like a sketchy reputation sometimes because if we look at it from a very practical sort of uh, perspective, sometimes you dream weird stuff. Like I was dreaming of zombies last night. Do I think that that is a message from spirit that there is an impending zombie apocalypse? Not so much. However, when you are in that dreamlike state, other messages can come in. So exploring dream magic as a divination tool, part of it is being really aware that sometimes your brain is just processing stuff. Maybe you watched a zombie movie and you're dreaming of zombies like I was or whatever it may be. But other times when we are in that dreamlike state, in my own perspective on dreams, I do think that messages can come in from loved ones, from spirit, from the other world. I think that we can soak up these messages and that is my own perspective on dream magic. So exploring dream magic as in as a part of divination is something which is going to be very closely tied to your approach to spirituality, to your interpretation of dreams and the dreams you have. You can draw on a lot of different dream resources, but at the end of the day, it's going to be your understanding and what you think of those dreams, which is going to be the main interpretation, the main sign coming from spirit. So if you are looking to get into dream magic, Magic, then I would suggest as a very, very first sort of baby step to just have a think about what you think about dreams in general and 
how you differentiate between zombies in your dreams and messages and signs from spirit or loved ones or whatever it might be coming through. And from there you can then explore uh, books and resources if you are feeling called to or you can pair this with the tarot with the oracle which is something I do if I have a particular dream come up. I will do a tarot spread for it and just see what sort of messages are coming through from the tarot language based on this dream that I had because that helps me to visualize it in another term outside of the dream as, as the signs, as the ways and messages that are coming through. So that is it for our video on alternative forms of divination and how to begin exploring the signs beyond the cards. I would absolutely love to hear from you in the comments below what sort of forms of divination you incorporate into your practice, what sort of resources you draw upon for these, whether it's all intuitive or it's a combo of intuitive books, blogs. I'd love to hear about it in the comments below. If you like this video and you would like to see more like it, do hit the like button and hit the subscribe button so that we can hang out and continue having more magical discussions together. If you would like to join me over on Patreon, each month we explore for a new magical topic. Right now we are moving through to series, the Wheel of the Year series, exploring seasonal magic alongside exploring elemental magic. And all the details for my Patreon are in the linky section below. And that is all for me for today. I wish you a most wonderful day full of magical signs from spirit.